Well, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to have Davy laundering today with me. And Davy is a CFA and CMT, which is something that I would love to have someday too. I know it's a really difficult thing to do, but I really admire you just for the fact that you have on your back on your wall the two certifications. <laughs> right. I think is um, uh, I'm from Venezuela. I don't think there's anyone who has the two certifications in my country. You can have people have CFA, but also all other groups have the CMT. Right. So, so welcome to this um, uh, space where I bring to my community, Latin community, people that are portfolio manager, people who have experience like you. And it's a pleasure to have you today. How you, how's it going today? It's going great. Uh, thanks very much for having me on. I, it's a, uh, it's always great to, to be able to talk about the markets to different communities. I don't believe I've ever spoken to the Latin American community, so okay. this is the first for me. And uh, I, I, uh, I speak a little Spanish, but I wouldn't go there if I were you. <laughs> That's actually my first question. How's your Spanish? Can we do this thing in Spanish? <laughs> I, I, I learned how to speak Spanish uh, when I was working in the Dominican Republic. Oh, okay. Uh, for a summer, I was overseeing the construction of a condominium project. And I didn't speak any Spanish. And so I brought my younger brother's textbook, uh, Spanish textbook down to the Dominican with me. And, and at night in the evenings, I would go home and learn how to say what I want to say tomorrow. Okay. And okay. that's how I learned Spanish. So that's good. I, that's yeah. good. So tell us more about yourself. So how are you starting on this business? I know it's kind of, your background is very interesting for people that still don't know you. You can summarize you, your background a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I, I've, I've been in the investment business for about 30 years. My entire career, I've been uh, focused on charts, so technical analysis. Um, as you said, I did get my CFA, so I have a very strong passion for fundamental analysis. I just don't do it myself. I let the market do it for me, uh, which we can talk about. Um, and, you know, I've, I've held positions most recently up, up until most recently I was the director of technical research at Wellington Management in Boston, which is a large uh, privately held money management firm. Um, and I was also a, a portfolio manager there. And prior to that, I had a couple of uh, research firms that I started myself. And the, the latter of, of those uh, companies was called Breakaway Research. And that's how I ended up getting to Wellington because they were one of my clients. And then prior to that, I was I was a, a technical analyst at Fidelity, in the in the Fidelity chart room, and uh, so it's been a, a it's been a, a great career. I've had the opportunity to work with some of truly, and I mean this when I say it, some of the best money managers in the business. You work and, with uh, Davy Keller as well. So I I know Davy Keller through the uh, through the CMT community, but um, Dave joined fidelity just after i left fidelity okay so i don't i don't think that was he i don't think he replaced me but i think i think he came in in a different role and then he ended up uh ended up actually managing this the uh technical team at, at uh, fidelity but i i know dave he's a fantastic guy yeah so he's he's a good yeah, friend one of well. the nicest you'll know yeah. <laughs> yeah so let me ask you this so um were you more, when you started your career, were more focused on the CFA first and then in CMT or was, was first? Well, I mean, interestingly, interestingly enough, I actually got my CFA first and I got it while I was a technician at Fidelity. So um, I, I think the reason I did it was because I was, most, most of my audience, uh, or I should say almost all of my audience was of course at Fidelity and they were fundamentally minded portfolio managers and analysts. And I, I wanted to learn how to speak the language and whatnot. So, and I also, I knew that the, the CFA was really difficult to get and I'm always up for a challenge. So I went ahead and did that. And uh, I got that, I think in uh, 99. And I, I later got my CF, my CMT charter when I joined Wellington. And I, so I only more recently relative to my career, more recently got my CMT charter, even though I've been to tech, technical analysts uh, my entire career yeah oh i don't know if you know uh craig johnson he's in of course yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. let me ask you this one time i asked him uh, well, i think it's a long time 2015 or 2016 asking 
What do you think is more important, the CFA or the CMT? Asking this question, he said to me, um, the CFA gave me the job and the CMT kicked me in the job. So well, what are you story behind? What do you think? Is well, you know, that's so, it's so funny you, you preface that question the way you did because uh, I was going to answer the question with exactly what you just said and give, as I always do, because I love that saying, but I always give credit to Craig for saying that. But, but I think uh, that's an important point that the CFA has a, has a lot of um, credibility in the community. In fact, I, I, I just gave a presentation to um, the, uh, to students at Babson College here in Wellesley, Massachusetts, which is where I went to school. And, and uh, you know, prior to the class, I asked them all who plans on getting their CFA and 100% of the students put their hands up. So that's how important it is. It's, it's, a, it's almost like a must have on your resume uh, in that regard. But there's, there's, a, there's a lot of theoretical type of uh, analysis in a CFA. There's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's just, there's a, it's really different between a CFA and a CMT. And the main difference being that the CMT is very practical and it's very actionable and it's very, very focused on risk management. So that's, I think, what Craig, Craig meant when he said the CFA helped me get my job because of the credibility and everything else, but the CMT has helped me keep my job because it is so focused on making sure I own the right things, regardless of what the CFA tells me I should be owning. And it, and it also helps me very strictly and very cleanly manage risk. And that's so therefore allows me to keep my job. And it's also funny that my current role that I have, I'm surrounded by CFAs only. <laughs> the only one who's yeah. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes the discussions are, you know, <laughs> like they ask me, why are you doing the the CMT first and then you leave in the CFA the second? Like, well, I got the job already. So <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think um for, for people that are uh, yeah, that's a good point. But I, I think for people that are uh, thinking about getting both, I almost want to say, I, I kind of hesitate to say this, but I almost want to say you should get the CFA first, only because if you get your CMT, you're going to realize you don't need the CFA. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know what I mean? Because it's, yeah, yeah. it's uh, but we, we, we can talk a lot about uh, why, I, why I say that, because I, I don't mean that in, in any uh, derogatory manner. I mean, I, I fully, I have my CFA. I fully respect that. I love fundamental analysis. It's just that if you, if you choose to invest with a CMT mind and a CMT mindset, then um, never in, in a moment, never in a moment, do you disrespect or dis or devalue how important fundamental analysis is and how, how important the, the actual fundamentals of a company are. It's just that if you're a pure CMT investor or a technical investor, uh, the way I say it is that you, you, you basically check your ego and your own opinion at the door, like your opinion of the fundamentals. So uh, fundamentals are very important, but between my opinion of the fundamentals and the market's opinion of the fundamentals, I'll go with the market's opinion all day long. So it's still, ultimately I'm aware that fundamentals are what drive outcomes, but, um, my, my, I've just come to recognize that the, the, the opinion of the market regarding the fundamentals is far more important than mine. Because if we think about it this way, if we have con conflicting views of the mark of the fundamentals of a company, for instance, meaning if the, if the stock is trending higher in a meaningful time frame, in a time frame that's driven by fundamentals, that means that the fun the market's assessment is positive of those fundamentals. But if I disagree with it, I'm going to lose money. So right. the only time this is just uh, it's a very simple but also very irrefut irrefutable or not refutable uh, statement that um, I, I can never make money unless the market agrees with me. Oh, it also um, reminds me of one of my uh, mentors that he said to me, you know, Ralph Acampora too. Yeah, uh, that's you, a great you, mentor to have. <laughs> yeah, he's a good friend. Um, he said to me, in the corner, there's a gas station and there are many ways to get to the gas station, but at the end, what really matters is you get to the gas station. It doesn't matter what role you get, but at the end is that. And if we were talking about um, managing uh, accounts, at the end, the customer is, 
was suspecting that you performed the best, no matter what you had to do. And when you talk about different ways to think about that final customer, not just being, um, in my personal opinion, being obsessed with just one thing and nothing else, you know, sometimes you had to, because the, the market side dynamic too, things can happen mm -hmm. yeah. and you had to adapt yourself for that kind of situations. 100%, but I, 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 think, I think that's a, a very important point, but that's for that very reason. That's why I, I value uh, technical analysis and it's why I've chosen to be a technician. I, I, like I said, I've, I've, I'm as passionate about fundamentals as I am about technicals. It's just that at the end of the day, um, I chose the, the technical route for very specific reasons. And one of the reasons is that um, the, the, the value of technical analysis and trend following in particular is it tells you when you have to change your mind. It tells you when things are changing, whether you can see it or not in the fundamentals. And it happens all the time where, where a company's fundamental conditions uh, begin to erode and um, it, 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 analysts aren't picking up on it yet, but the market is. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what, what, uh, what happened last year, we had we had uh, I, what I would consider to be, and what maybe in, in hindsight, we will come to call a, a growth bubble, where we had a very large percentage of the S&P 500 had a price to sales ratio that was above 20, which, and it, and it went to a, a degree that was far higher than the 99 bubble. So it was a, a bubble of epic proportions. Um, excuse the siren, I don't know if you can hear that. No, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sounds like I'm in New York City, but I'm actually in a, in a nice little harbor in Marblehead. <laughs> but uh, um, the and so a lot of those stocks trended like they did because of the powerful fundamental trends that were that were undergoing that they were that sort of that were underway. But since then, and since early 2021, a lot of those stocks are down 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent. And when you look at a lot of the fundamental trends, they're still intact. At least they appear to be based on looking at historical information as it has come out throughout 2021. So there's just been a big disconnect between the trend and the fundamentals. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you actually, although again, fundamentals are important. This is another reason I chose to be a technician is that you, you don't buy and sell sales per share or earnings per share, or you can't buy and sell management change. The only thing you can buy and sell is price. And the only way you can make money have to, after having bought price is if it goes up. And if that's but, the case, then why not spend most of your time on price and only finding those things that, that are trending in a time frame that's driven by fundamentals? And then uh, you, know, you can make the base case assumption that this, these stocks are trending in this time frame because the fundamentals are strong. And oftentimes, you'll, you know, for me anyways, what I find is that I, I, I discover what the fundamental reasons were later. And that's good enough for me. I, I mean, I don't have to know ahead of time why, it, it, why, as long as it's trending in a meaningful enough time frame to indicate that it's trending because of fundamentals, as opposed to trending on the hourly chart or trending on the daily chart, that's not enough to get me going because that's all driven by, as Charles Dow talks about in Dow theory um, in the late 1800s, you know, those short, those short time frames are driven by emotions and fears and concerns about the fundamentals and everything. But the, the, uh, the actual fundamentals, the things that actually matter are what affect the monthly chart and the weekly chart. So if you spend your time focusing on those trends and ignoring all the others, it mean, in another, another way of saying that is ignoring all the noise and the emotional baggage and whatnot that's, that's tied to the, the, the fundamentals and instead focusing on the actual fundamentals, which is displayed uh, in the trends on the monthly chart, you'll be, you'll be better off for that. And also reminds me of one of the conversation that I have with Brian Shannon. Uh, I think you're familiar with him. He's, he's a CMT too. That he said only price pays. <laughs> he always yeah. tells yeah. me the same thing. At the end, that's uh, what really matters. And I'm agree with you on that. So you have something to share with us today. Um, I think you're able, uh, you can share something. You have a, I mean, I, I have, uh, I have, as I said, I had just given a, that, okay. that uh, presentation at Babson. And um, so the, the, the level of 
understanding of technicals for the audience is what would you say it is from a scale scale of one to 10, 10 being they, they know technicals pretty well to one meaning they've never heard of it. Um, I would say between five and seven. Okay. So you talk about the people that, um, they follow me, they're trying to get more on the CMT level, but as some people are work on the CFA too. So, which means the, uh, and by the way, I'm gonna edit this video. So don't worry about, you know, I'm gonna cut some some part, but okay. yeah. so, well, I would say, yes, I'm, I'm trying to um, get more people involved in the CMT or CFA if they want to, rather than just saying, oh, I'm the best trade in the world, you follow my whatever. So it's more like, okay, if you're gonna learn something serious, learn this. If you consider that you can work in the industry first, and after that, having experience, you can work on your own as a you know, retail trader. Most people do the opposite, like try to get into the charts and then they want to be the successful retail traders at the end as you know 99 percent of them they fail because of yeah. many factors right that they want to pay their bills by trading that's you know <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah it's like a, well some people ask me that question like a, um like a, okay you 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 technically uh, working and living as a trader, yeah, yes, but doesn't mean that I'm doing that with my own account. That doesn't mean anything because to, in order to do that, my account has to be huge. As you know, taking the one, two percent, if you have small account, it's not going to work. But most people yeah. think that they're going to have a four, three thousand dollars account. They're gonna they're gonna do like Larry Williams. When they see the story about Larry Williams, maybe it's one Larry Williams every a hundred years. <laughs> so right, right, yeah, exactly. Not, and <laughs> actually, I talked to uh, I don't know if he, you know Ralph Beans. He's uh, yeah. he is a, one of the greatest minds that I have ever met in risk management. He, he was for some time the Larry Williams risk manager. And when he oh, was wow. in the competition, I had the opportunity to talk to him last year. And when he was in the competition, the trading world competition, when he made 11,000% in one year record, no, no one has done this before. I asked him, how was that year for him? And he said, he couldn't sleep. He, he, call, he would call me at 2 a.m. asking for these positions. And I would say, uh, or these ideas to trade these commodities because he was in the um, uh, futures, trading right. futures in order to win the competition. He was like, a, he, that guy was nonstop. He was in the 40s, mid 40s. He has all the energy. He would call me another Saturday at 4 a.m. Hey, how this idea? What do you think of when the markets opens on Sunday? Should we do this or not? So things like that it was crazy. He said, he will never repeat that again. And of course, for the tax purpose too, because making that money, how much tax yeah. you have to pay is crazy. He said, no, yeah. I don't want to do yeah. that anymore. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, the bigger the tax bill, the happier you should be, right? I mean, if it's the same tax rate, once you get to a certain level and, I'm, and I have to spend a million dollars in taxes versus $10 million in taxes. I'd pay $10 million in taxes all day long because that implies a much, much larger gain, right? Yeah, correct. So sign me up. <laughs> the bigger <laughs> the tax bill, the better. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, 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 we can take this in all kinds of directions, but uh, I, I'll just, um, I think it's important to talk about the, uh, the value of okay. technical analysis. And okay. so I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to share the screen here. Yeah, I, I saw your screen. Yep. Okay. Hold on. You're going to have to edit this, I'm sure. Yeah, I will. Don't worry. Yeah. 
and also had the opportunity to talk to Jack Swagger. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, Jeez. so <laughs> yeah, it was very interesting because he was, um, uh, that time when I talked to him, it was in 2020, he was doing a, uh, the his last book and he gave me a copy of his book. And after I got the copy, like 10 days later, we had the conversation. I had to literally read the book like every day, see what kind of question I'm going to ask him. You know, it was really yeah. interesting to talk to him. Wow, what a, what a treat for you to, to be able to do that. That's that's pretty, you've been, you've, uh, been quite successful. Maybe you need a career in broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you know, so I, 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 I doing this for right. fun, so. Yeah. Well, that's why you should do everything, right? Uh, yes. the money is, is nice if you can get it, but you got to have fun in life. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is, to me is one of the, the, if you, if you think about, um, the reality of the situation is there, there are, there aren't going to be a lot of people who, who just purely trend follow and are just pure technicians in, in, in many ways, that's actually, um, not the complete full value of a CMT charter, um, where, where we find uh, we, where we see people get great value from a CMT is to incorporate it into their process to help, so to help, you know, in many ways, it's to help uh, search for ideas. Technical analysis is great for being able to screen the market, looking for ideas, um, making sure that you own the right stocks, assessing the overall environment. Are we in a bull market or a bear market? Because that obviously changes how you should behave from a risk management perspective, et cetera. But I think the one, the one, aspect of technical analysis that really uh, where I've seen some very good portfolio managers uh, really benefit from is the ability using technical analysis to manage risk and the, and the importance of, of being able to manage, uh, manage risk. So this, this slide here just shows you if you were to, if you're a trend follower and you were to take all of your trades in a, in a given period, let's just say that this is a month or whatever, but uh, really, it should be much longer. It should be a full cycle if you can, if you can do it. But if you were just to stack up all of your trades on this along this horizontal axis, we see this is zero. Everything to the left is a loss. Everything to the right is a win. The, the the benefit of technical analysis is you know when you're wrong. Once trend breaks again in a meaningful enough time frame, so you're not just breaking, you're not just re reacting to every little trend break on the short term charts. But I'm talking about fundamentally driven charts. Um, once the trend breaks, you, you make the base case assumption that it's because the market's telling you something about the fundamentals. And so you act on that and you cut your losses short. And so that's the whole premise of what David Ricardo said in the 19th century, uh, cut your losses short and let your profits run. That's a, that's a, that's a statement that goes back to the 1800s. And it's a process that, and it's a, it's a philosophy that's been uh, adhered to, to by anybody who's ever managed money successfully, whether they know it or not, is the, is the idea that you, um, you have to cut your losses short and, and let your profits run. And so as a technician, because you're constantly cutting your losses short and because you're a trend follower without, without trying, to, uh, trying to determine ahead of time, this is just pure trend following. There's a lot of technicians that do it differently, but I'm talking pure trend following where you get into a trend and you don't make any forecast as to when it's going to end. And the reason you do that is so you, you can get these right, what's called right tail events or these outliers on the right side of this diagram. And so that this statement, cut your losses short and let your profits run, comes alive when you look at it this way. This is what a trend following uh, return uh, distribution looks like. Lots of, lots of uh, losses, small losses, some, uh, I'm not even say lots of uh, medium sized gains, but then some huge wins. In the, in, the, in the end, most trend followers, particularly over a full cycle, like last year or the year before, if you were trend following, you just, you couldn't do anything wrong because it, no matter what you did, the stock went up, right? I mean, it was unbelievable. I think my hit rate in that year was in, in the 80% 80, 80 range. Um, that's not normal, right? What's more normal is that through a full cycle, like last year, my hit rate was 40%. So I've had a, I didn't have a great year last year. So through a full cycle, if you can, what, what I mean by a full cycle is a bull market in a bear market, get those two things together. If you're as a trend follower, can finish that cycle with a with a with a forty percent hit rate, meaning that forty percent of the time you're right. That sounds terrible, and the diagram shows it here that you have a lot more losses than you have wins. But the reality is, 
the combination of being able to cut your losses short vis-a-vis -vis technical analysis when the trend breaks, but then also sticking with trends as long as possible until the trend actually reverses, that'll, that'll expose you to those right tail events in those, uh, those situations where you can let your profits run. That math comes together to create what's called positive expectancy. So if you have, in this example, 40% winners and you have $100 gain on average when, when you win, and you subtract from that 60% losers, and on average, you lose $33 when you lose, that's simple math that comes out to $20.20 as a positive expectancy. Assuming that that's a, a full cycle and you have confidence in the, in the strategy and whatnot, um, that's a strategy you should just keep doing because it works. If you, if you conduct this analysis, which I highly recommend everybody does this, who's, who's thinking about investing, that you, that you pay attention to how much, what your hit rate is and how much you lose when you, when you lose and how much you win when you, win when you win and do that math all the time. Because if you do, if you do that and you come up with a negative number, you, uh, you should stop immediately, stop doing what you're doing because it's a, it's a strategy that's gonna lose you money, right? So, the, and, and what's important about this is that that expectancy formula, no matter who you are, no matter what style of investing you choose to uh, un undertake, trend following, growth investing value, macro, quant, high frequency trading, it does not matter who you are. Everybody has to go through this gauntlet. Warren Buffett has to go through this formula. I'm sure he's aware that he is, but a lot of people are not aware of the fact that you have to go through this formula. Nobody can escape this formula. At the end of the day, you're going to have wins, winners, you're going to have losers, you're going to have a hit rate. And, and you lost money because your, your expectancy was negative. You made money because your expectancy was positive. And so the idea is to, is to track this throughout the course of time. And you know, an, an important point to think about is, as you can see down here in the right-hand corner, after you buy a stock, or whatever it is, cryptocurrency, uh, oil, gold, currency, doesn't matter what it is. After you buy something, there's only four things that can happen. It can either go, you can either have a small win, you can have a small loss, or you can have a huge win, or you can have a huge loss. Those are the four possible outcomes that you can have as an, as an investor. And you'll notice that on the diagram on the left, one of those four things is eliminated, right? right. There are no huge losses. And so that's the essence of trend following is to expose yourself to those three other buckets, be patient. Occasionally you'll get one of those huge wins that pays for everything else on the left side of, this, of the, the return diagram and importantly, avoid those huge losses. And you know, I've, I've worked with uh, a lot of very successful fund managers that are obviously pr primarily fundamentally oriented. Uh, and I, I've never seen one Who's, who's had a, as clean a risk management process as what I just detailed in terms of technical analysis, being able to understand that trend is broken in a, in a fundamentally driven timeframe, time to get out. But what I have seen is I have seen some very good uh, fundamental managers become great portfolio managers when they started to incorporate strategies that help them to avoid things in the bottom right-hand corner here using technical analysis, whether it be momentum ranking, trend following, relative performance, ho however you want to, uh, you know, get to that, get to that end game. The point is, it's critical to avoid huge losses. I also, um, I mean, also reminds me of the topic that you don't have to have the perfect strategy. All the strategies always are going to fail at some point. But the, the important thing is, this strategy, even though the win rate is less than 50%, still you can make money based on that principle, right? Yeah, there's no question. And there's a, there's a formula there that shows at 40%. And, I, and I've seen trend followers down at 30% still make money. But wow. um, you, know, you have to be super disciplined to make sure that you let those um, right tail events unfold. So um, you know, this, is, uh, this is the what it looks like when you do practice risk management. And I, this is another slide that I, I, I like to, to show, you know, what happens if you don't practice risk management. And so if you start over here on, on this, uh, on the left-hand side, and you can see you, you start with a portfolio value of $100. And through the course of the, of the year, you don't manage any of your risk. It's a bear market. It's, you know, the global financial crisis or whatever, and you lose 50%. So now you're down at $50. 
in, in order for you to get back to break even, your portfolio now has to go up 100%. And wow. speak to anybody in this business, the concept of doubling a portfolio, it's not impossible, obviously, but it takes time and it takes a strategy. It's not easy to do, but that's basically by not, by not um, deploying risk management in your process, that's what you've set yourself up for having to start from such a big hole, right? And then the other, the other thing to, to, to think about is this fallacy of it can't go much lower. And you say, you know, the, the, the stock, I've, I've uh, ridden it down 90%. It, it can only, you know, what is it going to go down another 5%? Just be, you know, realize that going from down 90 to down 95 from that moment is another 50%. So no matter where you get in, if you're a value manager trying to buy on the way down and you think it's really cheap and it's already down 70%, we have a lot of those stocks in the market today. Um, you know, down 70% is fine, but from there, it can still go to zero. It can still go down 100%. And so technicians, rather than trying to pick the bottom like that, what we prefer to do is wait for the, the, the actual trend to turn to indicate that the, the, the market agrees with us on the fundamentals. That's what I was talking about earlier about waiting for the market to tell you when to get in vis-a-vis -vis trend inflection. And the, the main thing is, is that the, the, the disastrous effect that not managing your risk can have on your portfolio. So if you look up here uh, on the top box here, this, this is a hypothetical portfolio um, and, and it's you know year one through 10 and these are the returns year by year, it just kind of alternates again, it's hypothetical, but it alternates between 20 and 30%. At the end of that 10 year period, it's a compound return of, of uh, 23%. Great returns, unbelievable um, performance, anybody would aspire to try to get to that point. It's, it's, a, it's a real standout type performance. But then what happens if that same manager in the very first year did not know anything about risk management and in his first year lost 50%, but then from there on out, from year two all the way to year 10 had the same exact track record. Because of that one year of dropping 50%, assuming that the clients even stayed with it, with the manager, because oftentimes you drop 50%, the client takes their money back and doesn't even give you a chance to get them back to break even. So down 50%, it takes several years to get back to break even. And by the time you get out to year 10, you've cut your compound return in almost in half. Oh. You know, so this is the importance of managing your risk. It's the most important thing you can, you can uh, actually uh, incorporate into your process, because if you don't, eliminate those big losses, you'll never be able to put together uh, a positive expectancy because it's such a heavy weight on the left side of the, of the uh, return diagram. And so, you know, just highlighting here, this is George Soros saying basically the same thing from, from the other slide. Um, you know, if you're, if uh, it's not whether you're right or wrong, that's important, but how much you make when you're right and how much you lose when you're wrong. That's the same thing as cut your losses short and let your profits run. In expectancy, it doesn't matter if you write 50%, 40%, 30%, doesn't matter. It matters how much you lose when you lose and how much you make when you when you win. Put those two things together. And if it's a positive number, that's what it's all about. So when you say, like, for instance, like, okay, you have, I don't know, four or 5% losses, but then on the fixed rate, you have 27% gain in just one that will probably diminish the other ones right so yeah, so yeah. okay it, it it pays for all those all of those small losses right the way i yes. actually think about it is is that most of the the sort of small gains because you have you have some like like medium-sized gains as well so not they're not all small gains but most of those actually pay for the small losses um but and so so the the right tail events are really the gravy. So obviously they help to, to pay for everything that goes wrong on the left side of the distribution curve, but that's where all the gravy is. That's where you really make your money. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, great presentation, David. Um, do you wanna show us something else or? No, I just, uh, I can't. Okay, okay, okay. Do you have any questions or? Um, do you have, um because i'm editing this um something we, we talk about train following do you have something about mean reversion too or, or it would be something similar um 
so the, the, the idea of mean reversion, again, is another strategy. That's one of the, yep. like when you, when you think about fundamental analysis versus technical analysis, those are sort of the two high level labels that you put yep. in these things. Underneath fundamental analysis, you have growth in value. Underneath technical analysis, you have trend following in mean reversion. Those are the technical equivalents of growth and value. And so it's, a, it's like anything else, you have to decide who you are as an investor, how, what kind of personality you have as an investor. Um, the, the thing with, with trend following is that you're making, uh, you, you're making the base case assumption that the market is right. That's what it requires mentally to be a good trend follower, to be a mean reverter, mean reverting analyst, a portfolio manager or a value manager, and, and you can even say a growth manager, those other sort of buckets, they, they all pretty much require you to come into the office every day assuming that the market's wrong, like the market's down too much, and so it's gonna revert, or the stock is cheap, and so it's gonna revert, or the stock is expensive, so it's gonna come down, or my expectations for growth are far better than what the market thinks, so the stock's gonna go up a lot. All of those other buckets, whether it be a growth fundamental manager, a value fundamental manager, or a mean reverting technician, they all come to the office every day with the base case assumption that the market's wrong. What makes us as trend followers, and it's why I'm a trend follower, uh, very different is just that we just believe the market's right. And you know that, that's really not a big leap of faith to, to, to uh, assume.